so for example, when we look at 9 plus 5, when we divide by 12, our remainder is 2. Or for another example, if I take 7 mod 3 is equal to 1, because when I take 7 divided by 3, my quotient is 2 and my remainder is 1. If I divide 7 by 3, I've got 1 left over. So this is called modular arithmetic. So if I take any number mod 3, I'm always going to get either 0, 1, or 2. Those are the only possibilities. So notice that mod 3, the only possibilities So this is what's called modular arithmetic. And again, I, I think this is really fun because, of course, you're, you're always taught that 1 plus 1 is 2, right? If whenever, you, whenever you want to tell someone, well, it's as easy as 1 plus 1 equals 2, then always in my mind, whenever I think about 1 plus 1 equals 2, I always think about this. One plus one mod two is zero. <laughs> so anytime someone says, well, of course, it's just like one plus one equals two, you can say, well, mod two is zero. So you know, it's not, it's not always two. Or another example, here's my other favorite one. So it's, it's quite possible that your high school algebra teacher is always hard on you. You know, like, like a common mistake, a very common mistake is for to interpret a plus b squared as a squared plus b squared. Do I have, do I have high school teachers in the room for a way to force their students to make this mistake? Yeah. So, so this is a very classic mistake, a very classic mistake. And so one thing you can do if you want to be snarky and reply back to your teacher, you can just say, well, I didn't make this mistake. I was working mod 2. Because if you consider this, so a plus b squared, is a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. And if I take this mod 2, 2 becomes 0. And so the cross term goes away. So this is equal to a squared plus b squared mod 2. <laughs> since 2 is equal to 0. So this is why I think, I think modular arithmetic is pretty fun. That's, that's why I <laughs> okay, so that's modular arithmetic. So now I just need one more technical. So this is the one technical thing I needed. I just have one more technical thing I need, and that's talking about exponentiation. So I want to compute. g to the power a mod n. And so what I want to do is I want to exponentiate. I want, I've got some, some number g, I've got some power a, and I want to exponentiate g mod n. And so I'm going to demonstrate this, rather than trying to describe this in general, I'm just going to demonstrate it with an example. So for example, let's look at powers of 2 mod 11. So if I look at powers of 2 mod 11, here's going to be my a, here's 2 to the a mod 11. So I start with a equal to 1, and 2 to the first power is 2. If a is 2, then 2 squared is 4. If a is 3, 2 to the third power is 8. I took 4 times 2, and I got 8. Now when I go to the next step, things get weird. Because I take 8 times 2, which is 16, but the remainder mod 11 is 5. So this is equal to 5 mod 11. And then for the next step, I can take 5, my previous answer, times 2. So I take 5 times 2 and I get 10. Then for the next one, I take 10 times 2 and I get 20. But 20 is 9 mod 11. Okay, so I want to do this just a little bit more without trying to erase anything else. So let me do this just a little bit more here. 
because what I want to show you is that this pattern repeats, which is rather interesting. So 7 is going to be 9 times 2, 18, which is 7. 8 is going to be 7 times 2, 14, which is 3. Then 6. 6 times 2 is 12, which is 1. And then after this, it starts to repeat. Because then 1 times 2 is 2. And I'm back to here. And then 2 times 2 is 4. 4 times 2 is 8. And so on forever. So if, you, if your powers are always increasing, then this pattern is just going to keep repeating again and again and again. So that's rather interesting. Very different from standard arithmetic, where as you take powers, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Here, it gives you one of the numbers in this list, and it seems kind of random. I mean, it, is, it, it isn't going to be clear that, that 2 to the 6th power of mod 11 is 9. And that's kind of strange. It isn't clear that that's the way it will work. And if you have different things that you're powering, then this sequence of numbers might be. So, okay. So, thanks for your patience. So that was just the two tactical things I needed, and now I can describe something that's called the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. So it's named after the two scientists who came up with it. One, one scientist, his last name was Diffie, the other's last name was Homage. And so it's named after them. And of course, again, like everything else in, in cryptography, this system was actually developed by other people earlier, but it was secret because they worked for the British government. So there were other people who came up with this before, but these were the first people who could publish it in the, in the public world. So, so it gets their names as opposed to people who actually invented it first. So this is the Diffie Homage and the point is, we want to share a secret. Just as we were describing before, so this is now under the, under the public key setting because they're going to be communicating in a public fashion, but they're not communicating a message. All they're doing is they're coming to agreement on some shared secret, which they can then use in a private key system. And they can do this without having to meet while communicating over an unsecured channel, like, like just a phone line that might be bugged or the internet, which might be, which is not secure in any sense. So they want to share a secret, and, how, and here's how they do it. So once again, I'm going to have Bob, who's communicating with Amazon.com. And what they're going to do is the following. Each of these parties is going to pick some exponent that's, and keep it private to them. So Bob picks a private exponent B, and Amazon picks a private exponent A, and the two together are going to share a power, a G and an M. They're going to share G and M together as part of their system. And so it's worth noting 